Back again, back again. Another episode. We're here with the big man pops. Swag one pops. You bless, yeah? Always, always. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Strong jeans. <laughs> uh, yeah, so today we're going to be doing Nimrod. We did a video, was it yesterday? Well, anyway, we did a video before. And uh, Nimrod, comma, Babel, City of Babel. No, Tower of Babel. What am I talking about? Go on. I'm wondering. <laughs> Dad, go on, help me out, man. Mine's going, let me drink I mine. can't remember what the video was, but we did do something that touched on uh, Babylon. Babylon, that's the it. History sorry, of Babylon. sorry, sorry. And I said yes. we need to narrow it down to Nimrod because he's the character that appears in the Bible and in the Quran. So, in terms of let's refine it rather than all of Babylon, let's look at Nimrod and his role in things. Okay, let's do that then. So, today we're watching Nimrod, Biblical Archaeology. Let's find out who, who my... Nimrod is one of the most mysterious and infamous characters in the Bible. You've probably heard a plethora of tales about this figure. Most of them are wholeheartedly concocted out of thin air and have no basis in history. But the reason they exist is because we know so little about who this person really was. All we have to go on is this brief passage in Genesis 10, which is why conspiracy theorists have tried to fill in the details with wild theories that just lack evidence. However, once we push past these, there are sound, scholarly approaches that give us reasonable possibilities as to who Nimrod was. There are several candidates offered by scholars as to who Nimrod was, which include ancient rulers such as Naram Sin, Imenhotep III, Gilgamesh, and Nemerkar, and many other possibilities. Having looked at the different theories, I'll present two theories I think are the most likely explanations. All of these are unprovable, but given what the Bible says about Nimrod, we can still make educated guesses. First, let's go over what the Bible says about him. He was said to come from the line of Cush, and was something of a mighty man and a hunter. He also was an empire builder. The beginning of his kingdom was at the city of Babel, which might be a reference to Babylon as well as the city of Uruk and Akkad, and another city called Kalna. Then he conquered the region of Assyria and built up other cities like Nineveh. So what we are told is of a king who reigned in the region of Sumer and then took over the region of Assyria. Now when we study the ancient Near East, this actually happened a few times. I'm gonna assume that Sumer is where the Sumerians come from. I'm just wondering why he missed the Kush part because I'm sure it starts with the man's from Kush. That's what and he's then he's it. gone to Syria. Who do you think of when you think of someone coming from Syria? You don't think of someone coming from Kush. No. So he's gone straight from, you know, he's from Syria. Hang on, you just said the Mandalayan starts in Kush. Yeah, so he said Kush, Sumer, yeah, which he is he showed Sumerian, Kush, and he said it? It, then when he went back to just start talking again, mm -hmm. he went straight to Syria without the Kush. But we know Kush, Kush is Africa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, is that like the first civilization to say? One of the older civilizations, okay, the yeah, Crusades. Yeah. So basically, all right. So so far, I'm saying that like Nimrod. My understanding, and I know I was going to do that. There is, I thought Nimrod, Nimrod started like Babylon or was the king of Babylon. Yeah, which is kind of what he just said. Yeah, it? is what he's saying, isn't it? And he, and he uh, built the Tower of Babel in that city, yeah? Well, he didn't say that yet, did he? I don't know, but I'm saying my understanding from before this. Yes, that's all I, like, yeah? Come. A few times. The first time it happened was at the rise of the Akkadian Empire, under someone called Sargon of Akkad. Oddly enough, when we compare the life and acts of Sargon, they surprisingly fit with the description of Nimrod in interesting ways which is why some scholars suggest the biblical Nimrod is just a description of Sargon. 
First, Nimrod was said to be a descendant of Cush. He probably was not a direct son, since he's not listed in verse 7. It is often assumed the descendants of Cush moved south into Ethiopia, but the reality is, it is likely they would have spread out and moved in different directions, as most people Wait, so hold on, let me, that again. That went by really fast, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 hold on, we'll come on and pause it. But, Cush, I thought Cush was a place, is Cush a person? No. So, I was about to say the people that lived in Cush descended down, basically. Descendants of Cush? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like Kush. descendants of Ethiopians? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just need to clarify sometimes, isn't it? Because it could be taken either way. Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, I was correct. Do. Some scholars have suggested the Kazites of Iran in the city of Kish could be connected to the descendants of Cush in some sort of way. In Sargon, actually was originally from the city of Kish. Now, as we noted in our video on the Table of Nations, sonship did not necessarily mean a biological connection. So Sargon could have been seen as a descendant of Cush being from the city of Kish. Second, one might object that Sargon doesn't translate to Nimrod, but this issue is easily dealt with, mainly because Sargon is probably not his actual birth name Yigyalavin says, We know very little about Sargon of Akkad himself. His real name is unknown. Sarukin, meaning the true king in Akkadian, is obviously a throne name. So perhaps Sargon's real name was something like Nimrod. But it is also entirely possible the name Nimrod is just a slang term. The name basically means we shall rebel. So it probably was a way for the Hebrew authors to say that rebellious one almost as a way to insult him, instead of naming him directly. Next, the text refers to him and how he began to be a mighty man. Some translations render this to mean he was the first on the earth to be a mighty man, and Sargon in a way is the first empire builder. However, Gary Allen Long and Douglas Petrovich argue it could mean profaning or acting irreverently in order to become powerful on the earth. This would fit with Sargon, but it could also fit with a number of other possibilities. The next line has thrown a lot of people off. Why does it note that Nimrod was a hunter? Well, it was a common motif in the ancient Near East to speak of kings as mighty and accomplished hunters of wild animals. There aren't any reliefs that have been found depicting Sargon this way, but a lot of what existed from that time period has been lost. Either way, we do have plenty of evidence for the theme. Steles from the 4th millennia BC at Uruk depict the king as a hunter. It is a well-known theme in Mari, Mycenae, during the New Kingdom of Egypt, and also in classical Greek literature. Yagilavin says, The first Mesopotamian ruler to boast of prowess in hunting was Tiglas Pileser I of Assyria, who titled himself Valiant Man, Armed with the Unrivaled Bow, expert in the hunt. He reports slaying wild bulls, elephants, and 920 lions. The theme was renewed almost four centuries later by Ashurbanipal. The Hebrew version of the legend then included this western motif of royal courage. So being depicted as a hunter fits with the cultural context and could fit with a number of rulers, including Sargon. The next three verses generally align with how Sargon built his empire. He started in the region of Sumer, and then went north and conquered the region of Assyria. Two aspects need to be addressed in verse 10. First, there is no issue with two of the cities mentioned. Even though we don't know where the city of Akkad was, it is mentioned several times in ancient Near Eastern literature, and the city of Uruk is not contested. But there is no trace of a city named Kalna in southern Mesopotamia. Talmudic literature identifies Kalna with Nofer Ninfi, which could be a reference to the city of Nippur. Another more likely possibility proposed by William Albright is to amend the vocalization of the Hebrew word, which would then translate as, in all of them, in the land of Sumer, which would just be another way of saying the rest of the cities in the area. Of course, the third possibility is Kalna is just another city that hasn't been located yet, much like Akkad. 
The second problem is during the time of Sargon, Babylon was not yet a city. Albright once said he had evidence that Sargon built Babylon opposite of Akkad, but unfortunately, he never produced his evidence. Douglas Petrovich has argued Babel in Genesis 10 should be a reference to the ancient city of Eridu. To his credit, there are several texts that equate Babylon with Eridu. The cities are equated by Barassus. A.R. George also lists several other early texts that equate Eridu and Babylon and indicate the traditions of Eridu became that of Babylon. For example, in one creation myth, Ea establishes Ezagil, and Eridu and Babylon are considered one, even in this very ancient time. So given the wealth of data on this, it is likely Babylon was seen as the new Eridu, and Eridu was seen as the old Babylon. Therefore, the Babel of Genesis 10 and 11 could be a reference to Eridu, not the later new Babylon established under the Amorites. Finally, the reference to Nimrod moving into the land of Assyria works for the most part. The verb for build can also refer to rebuilding or fortifying, and does not necessarily have to mean the cities did not exist prior to Sargon. Two of the cities, Nineveh and Kala, are easily identifiable. The other two have not been identified. But this is not a huge problem, since many ancient cities that have appeared in records have not been identified in archaeology. So Sargon could fit the description of Nimrod. But there is another interesting option, which is to identify Nimrod with the later Amorite king Hammurabi. Hammurabi also had a kingdom that began in Sumer and extended into Assyria. Since he was a king, it is likely the motif of him being depicted as a hunter could easily apply as well. And the term Nimrod could easily be understood as a Hebrew title. Hammurabi was occasionally called Lugol Mardu, meaning King of the Amorites. But John Walton notes another word for king was En, and a title such as En Mardu does supply the necessary consonants that could have resulted in the Hebraic name Nimrod. The only difficulty is the Amorites were said to be from the line of Canaan, not Cush. However, the Sumerian term for Amorite meant Westerner, and it could possibly have been the case that several people migrating from the West were all seen as the same people, or all just called Amorites. As Mark Chavales says, it appears that the Amorites were not a people in any ethnic or political sense. The idea that they were social outsiders also appears to be outdated. Porter has proposed that they had social ties to local populations, mobile herding communities, belonged to the same peoples as their settled counterparts. Thus, they were not a separate people, but one dimension of the general populace. So Hammurabi's line could have mixed in with Westerners moving into Sumer and would have been considered an Amorite, even though he was not a Canaanite. This is possible, but still unprovable and speculative. As for the Bible indicating the Amorites were an ethnic group that descended from Canaan, it's possible there was an ethnic group called the Amorites, and the Sumerians just picked up on it and called everyone in the West an Amorite. But a more likely explanation is to remember biblical sonship does not necessarily mean a biological connection. Canaan could have been said to be the father of the Amorites, just like how Jabal and Jubal were said to be the father of anyone with a specific profession. Canaan was the representative father of the Amorites even though a specific Amorite king could have actually come from the line of Cush. At the end of the day, this brief passage about Nimrod seems to be about a king who began in Sumer and took over the region of Assyria. In my view, the most likely candidates are Sargon and Hammurabi, but these are only educated guesses and there are other possibilities. But given the description of Nimrod includes known ancient cities correlates to how ancient Near Eastern kings were depicted and can correlate with events that historically happened, it is probable the Hebrew authors are describing a real king that conquered the regions of Sumer and Assyria instead of a mythological figure. Okay, so... <clears throat> 
Obviously, I'm not up to scratch on my Bible. You Nimrod. Up to scratch on that. <laughs> Nimrod is a name that I've heard. Um, and the story, obviously. But I didn't know, like, he was a mythological figure. Like, there wasn't that much about him. So, really, people didn't know that much. Neither did they. It's just that passage, and that's it. He would suggest that, however. Mm-hmm. Like I said, there are. I'm sure the story of um. Well, the whole story of Babylon, the captivity of the Hebrews and stuff, all goes around Nimrod's reign. But maybe it doesn't specifically address Nimrod, but things that was happening. So Nimrod was a, the, so was Nimrod not the king yeah. who built. The this Tower of Babel. Babel. Yes. That's what I'm saying, but he didn't even touch on that at all. He was just talking about, no, he is was, Nimrod yeah, real yeah. or not real? So we need to find another video. We need to find out if Nimrod the was story, a character. Yeah, because I'm sure there was story. more to it than that. That was more a comparative with him and... Um, Saying that he could have ruled in different regions and what yeah, different regions called A mythological him. character. Yeah. And um, like I said, I think the names that he put up at the beginning were the Watchers so he's again well, that, suggesting that Nimrod was one of the Watchers one of those mm. descendants of those children somehow interesting interesting with that Gilgamesh and it is one yeah, of the yeah, Watchers yeah. and him say he's supposed that Nimrod could have been Gilgamesh and he had a list of other names as well mm-hmm. and this was said these were Watchers names so Mighty Hunter if was he a giant so it threw up a few a few thoughts, but it's not the story of the biblical or the Quranic story. So, yeah, fine, but interesting. That's all I'll leave it as. Yeah, man. You know what? I really want to dive into the story because isn't this um, the story of the Tower of Babel about how languages? Well, doesn't the result of it? Yeah, yeah. Um, mean that there's different languages. Yeah. So that's what interests me. When really. God destroyed the tower, then. You know, the languages were confounded, is the expression that they use. Everybody started speaking different languages. But before that point, before everyone in the world spoke yeah. one language. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, man. All right, then. So we're going to uh, dive a bit more into probably Babylon itself um, to find out what was going on at the time. But because I know there's the Babylonian stones as well, isn't there? Which are from Babylon, obviously. Mm. And they're meant to be like the Ten Commandments, but the, the original mm. Ten Commandments predating Christ by, I can't remember how many years, but mm. a long time, and it? And then a lot of the stuff that are on them stones are meant to have just been translated and put into the Ten Commandments. Mm. Is that what they call Ma'at? Ma'at, I'm not sure. But we'll see, we'll have a look. All right then, so that was Nimrod, Biblical Archaeology. Mm, video was all right. Didn't really tell me too much. It was a lot of assumptions. I thought my man was jumping a bit and I thought he was reaching a lot. Uh, there was a lot of could ofs, could be <laughs> possibilities. No, nothing really um, with no sustenance. But we know sustenance. that it's mythological now and that we didn't know. At True. The so yeah, we learned, we learned something. But um, yeah, we out. Peace. Peace. <laughs>